Welcome to the 11:30 Wednesday lunch and Bible study from Birmingham, Alabama, in the Church of Doctrinal Studies Bible Church. We're uh, normally we have lunch here at the church for people who have a break from their work. Uh, they come in and they have uh, they we fix them a meal and uh, I teach them while while they eat and then they go back to work. But because of the COVID-19 virus situation, we're not able to do that, so this is video, but live to you. Uh, today is our fifth and final lesson in the series, Quench Not the Spirit, and uh, that was, of course, taken from 1 Thessalonians 5.19, and uh, I'm going to give a quick review of last week's lesson and have a word of prayer and get into today's lesson. Uh, last week, the things I want to review with you from last week's lesson was that we learned three things. At least these are the three things I want you to remember uh, from our lesson. Last week, we learned that 50 days after Jesus' resurrection from the Jewish festival of first fruits, Leviticus 23, and after 40 days of post-resurrection appearances within that 50-day period, Jesus then ascended after the 40th day, ascended back to heaven, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority. That's recorded in Acts, the second chapter, 32 and 33. That's really important. The second lesson... Uh, the second idea or the second point that I want you to remember from last week's lesson is that on the 50th day after his resurrection, Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, baptized with the Holy Spirit. He baptized with the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of Matthew 311, 120 followers or disciples of Christ that had been involved in the upper room in Acts 1. He baptized them with the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit, and that was the initial act or event of Jesus baptizing and sending the Holy Spirit. We call it the advent of the Holy Spirit. That was called the Feast of Weeks or Harvest, because it involves 50 days, involved seven complete Sabbaths on the 50th day. So we went from Sunday to Sunday. That's why Sunday is important to the church, not Saturday. But the church gate was, was, was brought to birth. The birth of the church was at Pentecost in 30 AD. That's important for you to know. Matthew 3.11 was fulfilled Acts 1, 4, and 5 talks about it. Acts 15, Acts 2, 1 is the event. The third thing that I want you to remember from last week's lesson was that the beginning of Pentecost, 30 AD, the Holy Spirit, the advent of the Holy Spirit, at that point, he begins writing from that point, 30 AD out to 100 AD, 100 AD, he begins, he begins writing the scriptures of the New Covenant called the New Testament. He is now engaged in inspiring men under the, the historical gospel, Christ dies for our sins on a hill called Golgotha in 30 AD. He's buried, and on the third day of his burial is raised from the dead. It's a historical event, the gospel. It was prophetic in the Old Testament, historical there. And from that point, 30 AD till 100, when the canon of the New Testament was completed, the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit's job, responsibility among so many, was the writing, the writing of the New Testament and the teaching of it. He's got to write it. He's got to select people under the mandate of the Father, select people to write, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, Peter, Luke, 
you, you know all this. At the same time, he's got to engage in men with gift of pastor teacher, uh, the teaching ability gift uh, that the Holy Spirit distributes. To begin to teach this, these writings. As they're being produced, people are teaching them. And in 100 AD, thereabout, we have the canonization of the New Covenant and the canonization of the Bible. We have the Old Covenant canon. Now the New Covenant canon, they're put under one cover called the Bible. And I wanted you to be sure that you understood that from last week's lesson. There's another thing that I want you to get is that Jesus taught a lot on the advent of the Holy Spirit just prior to his crucifixion. That's the upper room discourse. That's uh, the Olivet discourse. And then he's arrested in Gethsemane, trial, and then crucifixion. This is it. When he began to teach his disciples both in the upper room and in the Olivet Discourse over this period called the Last Supper, that period. The, the, the great teaching that he gave on the ministry of the Holy Spirit is recorded in John 14, 16 through the, 15, through the uh, 16th chapter, verse 15. That, that's the content the context of his teaching on the advent of the Holy Spirit is really important. I'm going to say it one more time. If you're writing, you didn't pull down our notes, and you're writing John 14, 16 to John 16, 15. That, that, that's a section that's really important for you to understand because that the church age under the new covenant the church age under the new covenant, it's all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church. So it's really important that you get that. Let's have, stop and have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the Christian's life. He has stopped walking in the spirit. He has started walking in the flesh. That's carnality. How do you get out of carnality and back into the spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit? Confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the work of 1 John 1, 7, cleansing. There's two aspects of the cleansing from the blood of Christ. One, for the unbeliever, he gets cleansed from Adam's sin, Romans 5. He has to believe in order for that to work. He has got to believe the gospel. And when he does, then that he gets cleansed from 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin. On the other hand, for the believer, it's confession. If you confess your sins, you are cleansed. The one work of Christ on the cross dealt with these two issues. Sin in the unbeliever life, Adam's sin, and sin in the believer's life, personal sin. So 1 John 1, 9, I'll give you a moment of time. Confess your sins. It could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. It becomes your responsibility as a believer priest, 1 Peter 2, to confess your sin to the Lord. So I give you a moment of that so the Holy Spirit can teach and recall part of the lesson of the Holy Spirit. And so we can get in our, our final discussion on quenching not the spirit called the indwelt by the spirit forever. That's our today's lesson. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence to confess sin if necessary. To have a prayer that God would reveal great truths to your life, not just for your life, to share it with others. Father, we're thankful for your grace, mercy, and love that's been extended to us through our salvation in Christ when he died on that cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give us life everlasting. And not only life everlasting, but the abundant life and time.
that's extended into eternity in awards and rewards and crowns and all so many things, Father. I pray today the Holy Spirit would once again minister out of John 14, 22 to teach and recall, to guide, to lead all the things that we've discussed out of the John 14, 16 uh, through the 16th chapter, verse 15. I pray, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today's lesson is, goes back to the beginning of the original teaching of Jesus at the Last Supper on the Advent ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to go back to John 14. If you have your Bibles, let's go to John 14. John 14, verses 16 and 17 where he begins this discussion in great detail, laying out the blueprint of the Advent ministry of the Holy Spirit when he comes. He said in verse 16, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may be with you forever. Let that word forever sink into your soul. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's the Holy Spirit. Notice the word another, another like Jesus. The word is alas in the Greek language. It means another of the same kind. In other words, Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, is given a functional title here. In fact, there are two functional titles given to him in this wonderful discourse, e even in our Bible lesson. The second, that's the first functional title, the helper, the paracletus, the helper, the comforter, the consoler, the exhorter. In verse 17, and listen, when he comes, he comes forever. Now listen to verse 17. That is the spirit of truth. That's the second functional title of the Holy Spirit in his advent. The first title, the helper, the comforter, the consoler, exhorter, etc. The second functional title is that the spirit, he's called the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because they can't receive it because if the world does not behold him or know him. You can go back to 1 Corinthians 2.14. We're all born to, into the world, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him could come out of the world of perishing and receive eternal life. That's John 3.16. The world does not hold him. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, the world does not have the spiritual moxie or understanding the Bible in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the world uh, views the gospel as foolishness until they get saved. Well, he's called the, spiritual tr the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is not for the world. That's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in uh, John 16, uh, 7 through 11. John 16, 7 through 11. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does, does not behold him or know him. But you, a believer, a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, one who does believe the Messiah, but you know him because he, watch this now, because he abides with you now and will be within you and be in you soon. The idea that's future tense of be in you. He is with you now. See, that's old covenant. The Holy Spirit came alongside. The new covenant is the Holy Spirit comes inside. He's teaching that. And when he comes inside in verse 17, he's there forever out of verse 16. Mm -hmm. 
That's the indwelling. When he comes inside, he's on the outside. He comes on the in. He was on the outside working with believers on the outside of believers in the old covenant. He didn't come inside. Under the new covenant, he's not working on the outside. He's working on the inside of believers. That's the new covenant, and that is the new covenant. That's Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. His advent. You need to really understand that, my dear people. The Holy Spirit dwells, indwells in you, indwells every church age believer from the moment of salvation forever. Uh, uh, Paul is going to use that idea in Romans 8.11, and he's going to use the Greek word oikeo and add the preposition in, E-N-O-I-K-E-O, in oikeo. Oikeo, in oikeo. That means to dwell inside. That's Romans 8, 11. Here he's teaching it. Paul brings it into theology of the new covenant in Romans 8, 11. Well, you should read that. It would be beneficial to your life as a believer. I'm going to talk about four things this morning about quenching the spirit. I'm going to talk about four things about quenching the spirit. When you... Give up the theology of the indwelling under the new covenant church age for a false premise that says you can lose the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That same group of people will tell you you can lose your salvation with it. Nothing could be farther from the truth, and that's an apostasy teaching. It's apostasy. I'm going to show you all my scriptures. That's for sure. The people will say on the side that you can lose yourself. Well, what suppo suppose a person gets into habitual sin? Isn't that evidence that they're not saved? No, it's evidence that they're in habitual sin, that they're in a state of carnality. What will be, what will be the father's response to a state of carnality? Well, let me cover that quickly with you. So let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter of Hebrews. And I'll cover that. Get that out of the way so we can get on with believing the truth of the word of God. I'm in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. And this subject begins in verse 5. He says, you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, children of God. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. You will notice that he's quoting out of the Old Testament. That's the only Bible they have at this time. The rest of it is being written. The canon, the Bible they're carrying around and studying. The Bible that Jesus is teaching out and the early disciples are teaching out of is the old canon. And they're trying to show out of the old canon uh, doctrinal truths about Christ. That he not only, did, not only did he save those under Adam's sin, but he also, the blood of Christ, also works on behalf of the believer. On behalf of the believer. And when a believer gets into carnality, the father disciplines him. He disciplines him. In verse 7, it said, it is for discipline that you endure. It is because God disciplines you. He's trying to correct your behavior and the way you're thinking about life and the choices you're making. You need to come back to the word of God. What's the Bible say? And follow that course. Walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17, based on the action of it in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you 
as with sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? Correct behavior to get into a better system of their life. But if you are, watch this now. Here's your verse, 8. But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, if you're a son of God, divine discipline is a natural course of events in your life if you get carnal. Then, listen, if you are without discipline, if you, are, if you get into habitual sin and you are not disciplined by the Lord, and he talks about it earlier, light discipline, reproof discipline, and scourging. That's three forms up early. He talked about it, and he quoted out of the scriptures of the Old Testament. If you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, and that is part of being a child of God, then you are illegitimate. King James calls them bastards. That's the word illegitimate. King James, in their day, that was a bastard. We cleaned it up a little bit into the English uh, later day, illegitimate children, not sons. And then he goes on to talk more about discipline and what the purpose of it is. If you're in habitual sin and not being disciplined by the Lord, you're not saved. You're not a son of God, he says. You're a son of Adam. You're not a son of God. Well, let's take a look. That should clear up that question. Let's take a look onto point number one. We can quench the Holy Spirit by aborting the doctrinal principle of the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you leave the doctrine of the advent of the Holy Spirit and that one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is to indwell you from the point of salvation. This is new covenant teaching. In other words, you're going to find this information in, in the New Testament. I've recorded all that and set it out for you to study in a little pamphlet called 50 Things You Can Never Lose in Time and Eternity Dealing with Your Salvation. You should read that. Eight works of the Holy Spirit to point of salvation. We're under the new covenant and the advent of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can quench the Holy Spirit by believing that you can lose the Holy Spirit's security of his eight works of salvation. When you get off the road of learning the truth of the advent work of the Holy Spirit, you can get yourself tangled up into all kinds of foolishness. You go back to the New Covenant, you read the New Covenant, what it says. Now I'm going to look at four things. I'm going to look at four of the eight works of the Holy Spirit that I think is important to your security. Once the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he's not permitted to ever leave. John 14 16. He's there forever. John 14, 16 and verse 17. The end one, let me mention, here's what I'm going to just mention four. I'm going to briefly mention them. You've got to study them. The, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit forever. He's never going to go, leave your once you believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead the third day, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit. One of those eight is to indwell forever. Now, can you say in your mind today, forever? Now, listen, when you say forever, it may not mean forever because you're just blowing smoke. I'm going to love you forever until death do we part. Think how many that never worked out on. 
That's not God's system. That's man's system. If it don't work out, I'll just exchange. Go a different way. Do a, go a different. I'll throw that idea out. But let me tell you, when God says forever, he understands forever. You don't understand forever. You will when you die and go to be with Jesus. You'll understand forever. Forever is a term we use, but very seldom live. It's very difficult to live that concept forever. It's an enormous concept. But listen, when the Holy Spirit takes up residence, he's there forever. God says forever. Forever is forever. That's a word that expands time and eternity. Forever. God is forever. The Holy Spirit is forever, and he is forever in you. There is nothing in your life that you do that can get him out of your life. It can bring discipline from God to your life, but he is not permitted to leave. I don't know how to tell you that. Now, all of your family may, they may leave, and your church may leave, and a lot of believers may leave, but the Holy Spirit will never leave. John 14, 16, and 17 where Jesus is discussing when the Holy Spirit comes from the Father that I will send. And he has been functioning that way since 30 A.D. We're at 2020 A.D. And it's not changed anything. Don't anybody change the Bible on you. My, my. He is with you for how long? He indwells you how long? Forever. The other thing that's important, that's a security idea. <laughs> is, that not, is that not a wonderful idea about security? Come on, people. Here's another one that's great. One of the, another one of the works of the Holy Spirit of salvation is to seal and earnest. The idea of sealing is to sign a contract and give a down payment is earnest. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence, God signs off my property. I own that piece. Bought, waiting for the day of redemption. You are sealed contractually by God. Until the day of redemption. Sealed. Signed and delivered. There you have it. And how long? Until the day of redemption. I'm going to connect a couple of things to you. So if you're writing, don't have the notes, and you're just writing, you write down Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. 2 Corinthians 1, 2021, 20, probably go to 22. And here's what you want to put down there with that Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Watch this now. Put down chapter 4, Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. Because in verse 40, he says, sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, that's, that's the day of the rapture when you receive your body, church age believer. Sealed. <laughs> Sealed until the day of redemption. Every person that believes that Jesus died for the sins was buried and raised on the third day of his burial. Sealed until the day of redemption. Not to the day, the first day you get in sin, or not to the period of state of carnality. Mm -mm. Day of redemption. Here's the third thing that I think seals the deal spiritual birth. 
in theology, we call it regeneration. But here's what Jesus taught Nicodemus. Once you are spiritually born in Christ, you are forever born again in Christ. Once you are born again, you're always born again. Once you are born again, you're always born again. Once you are born again, you are always born again. John, the third chapter, verse 1 through 21. His discussion with Nicodemus. The problem is everybody reads verse 16 and don't read the chapter. Titus, third chapter, verses 4 through 7. 1 Peter 1, 23. You're spiritually, when you are born again, you are always born again. Jesus, Nicodemus, had the physical realm. Well, if I'm born again, how can I be born? He's talking in the physical realm. If I'm born physically, I'm born. That carries me all the way to death. You mean I have to have another physical birth? Go back to my mother's womb and be born again? He said, no, no, Nicodemus. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit and truth. You've got to be born of the Spirit and the Word. Once you are born again, you're always born again. There's never a day when you can go back to the physical. Once you're born again, you're born again. You're in the family of God. And you are from that day forever a child of God by the grace of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a what? It's a gift. Merry Christmas. It's a gift. The fourth thing that I would like to point out, I'm just going through quickly the eight works of the Holy Spirit. Here's another one I think seals the deal. I'm going to give you the four. All eight of them seal the deal, but I'm giving you four that should be understandably seal the deal. Any one of the, any one of the eight seals the deal, but I'm giving you eight. Right here, I'm going to give you four of them. The last one I want to give you is spiritual life. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit enters your life and you have spiritual life. Spiritual life. Nobody has spiritual life. I don't care if you go to every church and join every religion. Apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can have no spiritual life. You can have religious life. You can have altruism. There are a lot of good works and things you can do, but it doesn't lead to salvation. It is not that. You've got to be born again. You've got to be regenerated. Spiritual life is given at the moment of salvation and extends from time to eternity. What the, what the Bible technically in theology calls spiritual life is eternal life. Eternal life. It's life that lasts forever. It's not life that's temporal. Physical life, temporal life, birth to death. This is from birth forever. From life to life. In 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16, Paul says you go from life to life. The believer goes from life. When he dies, he goes from life to life. He don't go from life to death. He goes from life to life. When an unbeliever dies, he goes from, from life to death because he's spiritually dead. He goes spiritual death. First John 5, 11 through 13, what he's talking about in spiritual life is eternal life. He said, eternal life is in Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. That's a locked deal. That's positional truth. If you are in Christ, listen, eternal life is in Jesus. If you're in Jesus, you have eternal life. (laughs) 
2 Corinthians 5, 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Galatians 5, 22 says the believer is living by the dynamics of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Living. That's John 10, 10. He is living the abundant life of spiritual life. He's, he's living the abundant spiritual life. He has spiritual life and salvation. As he grows and walks in the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, he begins to experience all the blessings of God that is designed for his life in time as well as in eternity. John 10.10, 10, Jesus calls that the abundant life. You can add with that Romans 8, 9 through 11. Listen, there are so many ways for you to listen. One passage in ours is, would, should, should sign the deal in your life. The Holy Spirit takes up residence at the point of salvation. He can never leave. He's there forever. That should, that should be sufficient, but I gave you three more. Here's the second point in our lesson today. Jesus gave two functioning titles in his discourse on the advent of the Holy Spirit to his disciples. He said, another comforter like him, I've got to leave. Another one's going to replace me. The second member of the Godhead is going to leave earth and go back to heaven. The third member of the Godhead is going to leave heaven and come to the earth. That exchange from the second member to the third member is called another helper, another comforter, another of the same kind. This is why Jesus in, in John 16, let me get back to John. In John 16, 7, 16, 7, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage I go away. Let that sink in a moment. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he talks to, about the world in 7 through 11 and talks to the Christian. I had covered that last week in verses 12 through 15. What a wonderful idea that you have with this. So one functional title, another helper... And a second functional title, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. That Both of these are mentioned in John 14, 17. Right? I put them in the Greek on your paper. Now, let me show you something interesting about the word of God. Because in context, context is everything. So, when you look at John 15... Uh, John, I mean, John 14, where I am. I'm in verse 16 and 17. But let me show you something. Look at John 15, 14, 15. Now watch this. If you love me, and it's a third class condition, by the way. Jesus is saying, I want you to stop and seriously think about this right now. Because you say you love me. I'm not sure you know what that means. I think you're talking from a world viewpoint of love and not a spiritual viewpoint. That's that third class condition. This is up for grabs right now, guys. Now watch this now. After his resurrection, in John 21, he has a conversation once again with Peter on this very same subject after his resurrection in a post-resurrection appearance with Peter. Very famous passage. Peter, do you love me? And you know what? 
between chapter 14, 15, and 21, chapter 14 to chapter 21, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Peter still don't have it. Because, and listen to me closely, because you cannot love God the way God demands in the flesh. It can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts at the moment of salvation. You love God in the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the love he's talking about. The disciples were calling, I love Jesus, by the way the flesh and the world thinks. But when the Holy Spirit comes, that's a whole different ball game. Now watch something. All I did is gave you the word if. If you love me. You're not there yet. You will keep. That's an imperative. That's a command. That's tereo. You will keep, guard, value my commandments. What I'm teaching you. What I'm telling you to write down. What I'm telling you is vitally important to your life to get from point A to point B in your life. If you love me, it's up for grabs. Because it can't be done in the flesh and worldly view. But one sign is that you begin to keep my commandments. You take them serious in your life. You begin to take the word of God serious and make your choices based on it and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I will teach and recall. I will guide. I will lead. All these things we've been talking about. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. I mean, can you pause a moment in your own life and listen to the Holy Spirit? I was watching a Hallmark movie the other night with my wife. She loves Hallmark. I'd rather, love Hall I'd rather watch Hallmark than anything else because it's closer to my view of life. And since my wife loves it, I've grown to like it too. This guy and gal were out at a little lake, a pond, and they were fishing. She was a weather forecaster that went by the book on science, and he was a guy that learned from nature. And this is really interesting, because he says to her, shut your eyes and listen. What do you, what do you hear? And she said, I hear the winds. I hear the wind. He said, well, I want you to be quiet, and I want you to listen a little more. And so she did, and he says, what do you hear? And she said, I hear crickets. Then he, he gave her a little formula. Count the crickets in 14 seconds. Add 40 to it, and you will have the temperature of today. See, what I'm saying is the disciples were not listening. Their value system was in the world. It wasn't in God. And so he tells them, if you love me, and it's up for grabs right now in a third class condition, you would keep my commandments. You would pay attention to what I'm telling you. You would take notes. You would begin to apply the word of God to all your decision processing. Most of us never include the word of God in our choices, in our decisions. We only we only include them when it all screws up in the end, and now we're in trouble. Now we want to know what the Bible says. Just like the disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, you see, if you love me, in verse 15, you would keep my commandments. Now look at verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will soon be in you. 
See the background of that passage? Uh, do you see the background of that passage? You know, <clears throat> I love a statement Paul said about what God gives you, the world can't. Let me tell you what God can, let me tell you what the Holy Spirit can give you that the world can't give you with all their wisdom. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, he says the Holy Spirit will teach you the deep things of God. Listen, the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, will teach you the depths of Listen to this now. You're missing it. The depths of God. That's what I want. My spiritual growth has led me to desire to know the depths of my relationship with God. I didn't get there because I sat under a, a, tea, a, a tree and drank tea. I got it because I put my head in the word of God. And then put the word of God in my head and I began to let it make decisions and choices for me in my life. That's what Jesus is trying to encourage his disciples to do. And they're not listening any more than you are right now. You need to change your attitude about hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. That's how you walk by faith and not sight. You got to get this, people. In the greater context of John 14, 16, where Jesus is teaching on the Holy Spirit all the way to the 16th chapter, verse 15, Jesus is referred, referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He calls, the, he calls him the helper four times and the spirit of truth three times. And I record it on your paper if you're writing. Well, that'd be John 14, 16 and 26. John 14, 26 and John 16, 7 as far as the comforter. On the spirit of truth, he teaches it in John 14, 17, 15, 26, and 16, 13. No, I'm not going to repeat them. Go back and study it on the internet with us, doctrinalstudies.com. Later, John wrote and addressed the danger of the Holy Spirit's ministry as the spirit of the truth in John 4, 1 John 4, 6. In 1 John 4, 6, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us, the teacher. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, the way people listen to the word of God being taught, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. See who's in contest? You know what the spirit of error is? Error in the word of God. You know what the spirit of truth is? Finding consistency in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit is not going to mislead you. His, his title is guide and disclose. We taught that this in this series. Point three, the advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was not a mystery doctrine. In fact, Peter quotes Joel, the second chapter, 28 through 32. But here's what people miss. The mystery that's in Joel 2, 28 through 32 is the church. You see, Joel 2, 28 through 32 deals with the first and second coming of Christ. They were not separated under the old covenant. They are separated under the new covenant because the mystery that separates the first coming from the second coming of Christ is the presence of the church. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I know. You're, you're, you're saying to yourself, I've never heard this before. Ah, you have now. You have now, my dear friend. So that's the problem with Joel. People want to use Joel all over the place. When Joel, when you quote Joel, you're talking about one advent. But you see, at Pentecost, Peter's preaching that. But listen, he doesn't understand the mystery yet. The mystery is going to come with the advent of the Holy Spirit and the development of the church. The church is what divides 
the first coming from the second coming. Listen, here's a mystery. That here's a mystery doctrine of the new covenant. The Holy Spirit would take up a residence, live inside of you forever. That wasn't taught anywhere else. In Acts 2, 14 through 21 and 32 through 41, you should pay attention to that. One mystery doctrine in the, in the church age of the new covenant was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in every believer forever. Paul in Romans 8, chapter verse 11, used a Greek word in oikeo. He doesn't dwell on the outside of you. He dwells on the inside of Not on the outside of a believer, old covenant. He dwells on the inside of the believer, new covenant. And he developed a Greek term for it. 2 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 2 Timothy 2, 14. Romans, the 16th chapter, verses 25 through 27. All of these talk about the mystery doctrines of the new covenant. Mystery doctrines of the church age. I'm appalled that people don't understand the new covenant has mystery doctrines and believers ought to know them. My, my, my. I gave you a bunch of scriptures to read. John 15, 26, 27, Colossians 1, 25 through 29, second chapter of Colossians, verse 2, Ephesians, the third chapter, 3 through 6. You must read that. Now, ah, let me do it. Let's just, let me just get Ephesians. It's easier for me to find it. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this mystery, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Which in other generations was not. Now he's talking about some mystery connected to Christ because Christ was known in the old covenant. My insight into the mystery that comes with Christ in which other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been now revealed to his holy prophets, uh, apostles and prophets in the Holy Spirit, church age. To be specific, now there are a lot of mystery doctrines in Christ and the new covenant, but I want to be specific about one. To be specific, that the Gentiles, which most of us, to be specific, that the Gentiles, would you want to know that? Are you a Gentile? If you're not Jew, you're a Gentile. Wouldn't you like to know the mystery of Christ? One of the mysteries of Christ as a Gentile? Here it is. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, the church, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then he goes on to talk about his life as a minister under the new covenant. Paul, come out of the old covenant and became one of the great writers of the new covenant. Think, how, think of the changes that had to come in his life to the word of God. What he had to unlearn to learn. <laughs> There's hope for all of us. Did you get all that? Well, I'm going to quote that one again. Ephesians 3, 3 through 6. Well worth your time, you Gentile. The mystery, one of the mysteries of Christ. And he tells you you are a fellow heir. Listen, he gave you three fellowships that you have in that mystery. In that mis mystery. Point number four. Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, 30 AD, was so that the Holy Spirit could baptize every church age believer into Christ in heaven and into the body, the body of the church on earth. I said, get that. God, God, listen, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, Advent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. 
to baptize into the body of Christ, to form the body of Christ with 120 disciples in Acts 1. That's where this Pentecost took place. It was that 120 Galileans that began to speak 15 different languages that this whole event occurred. Right there is the church of Jesus Christ. 120 is where it began. And then, then the Holy Spirit began to baptize and add to the church daily until we had 3,000 and then 5,000. Here you and I are. Here we are. The ministry of the Holy Spirit baptizing us into Christ, positional truth, and into the body of God. Listen to me. Oh, write this down. Galatians 3.27. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.13. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into the church, the body of Christ. Same time. In that baptism of the Holy Spirit, he baptizes you into Christ, positional truth. You can, never, you can never lose that. And into the church at the same time, into the body of Christ at the same time. When did he start that? Pentecost is where he started it. How long will it last? Till the rapture. That thing's going to go on till the rapture. That's the church age of the new covenant. Aren't you glad you came today? Aren't you glad you came today? Where are you going to learn this? Huh? Listen, I know I've given you a lot of information. You've got to listen to this several times to get it. When I, listen, many years ago when I heard it, I studied and studied. I heard those. I listened to I read that thing. I read those sermons over and over and over and over again until I could begin to understand it and grow in it. You can't get it in one hearing. Who do you think you are? you got to learn it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you're a baby, he can only teach you at a baby level. If you're mature, he teaches you at a mature If you're mature, he teaches you at a mature level. Come on. Gee whiz, people. Have pa some patience in your growth, but, but be growing. And know every day I'm growing in the Lord and through his word. I'm making choices. I'm making decisions in my life that's compatible with the will of God. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes every church-age believer into Christ who is seated at the right hand of God the Father, Galatians 3, 27. At the same time, the Holy Spirit baptizes every church-age believer into the body of Christ, the church, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That's, that's at the point of salvation. At the same moment, the Holy Spirit gives every church-age believer a spiritual gifted ministry to the church body. 2 Corinthians 12, just read the chapter 12. I know that's a lot of reading. Oh, my goodness. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. By one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. We were all made to drink of one Spirit. So, in conclusion, never let anyone mislead you to believe that you can lose the indwelling of the Holy Spirit or your great salvation in time or eternity. Never allow anybody to teach you that. You go back to the Word of God. You go back to this lesson. You let nobody do that. When you do, that's called quenching the Spirit. He cannot teach you when you refuse to believe. Do not fall for that. Do not go, do not do that, dear heart. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the freedom that we have to speak the truth of God in an open assembly. And thank you for the grace of God, Father that is able to take it to the internet, to the far corners of the earth, to people who are positive with volition that need to know that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you life everlasting. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I just quoted them. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who 
believes. I encourage you to do that. I appeal to you, I beg you on behalf of Christ for the great work and the grace of God to be saved by grace through faith and not of yourself is a gift. Receive that gift today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.